financial management uh, four. I just uh, finished current liabilities and yeah, long term. And long term liabilities, that's on at the bottom of page 32. Page 32 at the bottom, you got two groups long term debts. And long term debt is debt whose principal is payable in more than one. Year. It also includes bonds, as in long-term bonds. The other one is called long-term accrued liabilities. <coughs> Sometimes we say LT for a long-term accrued. You may have some accrued liability. Accrued liability is for some reason you need to deliver a good or service later or you may need to make a payment later, maybe two years, maybe three years down the road, maybe five years down the road. If you need to make a payment later, it becomes simply a long-term accrued liability. A simple example will be uh, some sort of a project. Somebody's going to be delivering a tanker, oil tanker or something else, or have some oil rig or other stuff, and they're going to say, very simple, we, you will finance the operation and we will pay only in on delivery in five months. Only when you deliver in five months, we're going to pay then. Well, they work for two years, they made the progress, and when they, you expect them to deliver in three years, you have to make a payment. But so far, they've delivered some of it. For example, they build a huge skyscraper, it has to be 120 stories, and they already built 60. Well, obviously, half of it is accrued liability. You don't have to pay it now, but they've already earned it and you have to pay it when it's over, maybe in two years. So that's a long-term accrued liability, okay? So a question on the exam may be, what is long-term accrued liability? Or it may be, provide a simple example of a long-term accrued liability. Or you can just make it up, you construct one for yourself. All right. And then you have owner's equity. The third part is owner's equity. And let me write one more in red. I already explained it. Paid in capital. And paid in capital very commonly in finance and accounting is called contributed. So, it may be actually confusing, but it's simple. When they say contributed capital, uh, I'm reading here page 33 at the top. Page 33. So, when they say contributed capital, it's exactly what I've been already explaining called paying capital. Just two different terms for exactly the same thing. And equity, the other piece is retained earning, already covered. Then on page 33, uh, we have one other piece, which is part of what's called financial analysis. And that piece is at the bottom of the page called working capital. So, working capital is simply the short-term assets of a business. 
from short-term assets of a business are also called current assets, are commonly called working capital. Now that's again from last lecture another explanation about why the word capital is so confusing. This is another meaning of capital, okay? Yet another meaning of capital. But we call it working capital, so when you call it working capital, it is crystal clear. It means short-term assets. And then from working capital, you can get the next one, the next concept is called net working capital, net. Net working capital, that's the last paragraph. The bottom paragraph on page 33. And net working capital will usually mean, and you have here actually a very strict definition. Uh, I'll give you the simple definition, but it's not correct. The simple definition is short-term assets minus short-term liabilities. That's the simple definition. So, you have the short term, the current assets, and then you get the subtract the current liabilities, that's the net working capital. The precise definition is on page 34, at the bottom of the page, net working capital, and I'll put in here the equality sign, is current assets, which is, again, working capital, And then you see, minus payables, and within the brackets, within the brackets, plus accruals, as in accrued liabilities. Well, these payables and accrued liabilities are basically the short-term liabilities. That's why it's fairly easy and simple to say current assets minus current liabilities. Again, that precision is not as important unless you're a financial analyst analyzing a company that you suspect to have liquidity problems and then you need to be very sharp. A company that you expect, or actually, sorry, suspect might be going into bankruptcy. Then you want to see networking, negative networking capital, and you want to see that you're not losing networking capital. That's a complicated topic uh, that you don't need. All right, so what else we have here? <coughs> Balance sheet, uh, market value, book value. Okay, that's it. Page 36, income statement. So what we did so far was cover the balance sheet. We went through the basic assets, went through the basic liabilities. Now we move to the <coughs> income statement. Income statement is more confusing. Fundamentally, it's simple, it's easy, it's straightforward. It's a lot of terminology and it gets very confusing. So first of all, it's Sales. Sales is how accountants call what we call in economics and finance. So I just put in here equal sign revenues. From here, accountants divide, de derive a new number called net sales. Net sales. And these are simply, sometimes they just call them sales revenues. Simply sales revenues minus some basic selling expenses or selling costs like transportation or shipping or some other commissions. So these are net 
sales. Net sales represent kind of like revenue numbers. That's it. And then you have a whole bunch of income. From here, you begin subtracting different costs. So, net revenues is the money that you receive, and now you subtract a whole bunch of things. First, you subtract operating costs. And this is simply operating cost. If you have difficulty seeing, all the first desks are free. Uh, you can move up front, you know, anywhere you like here. All right, so operating cost is a cost which is necessary to run the business in a normal way. Example of a typical operating cost for September in this university is air conditioning. Weather is so hot that running air conditioning in the classroom is a normal operating cost. Well, in January, probably we don't need air conditioning, so air conditioning is probably not a regular operating cost. That's an example of understanding whether it's really necessary or not really necessary. Well, what about this little camera? That's a more tricky one. Yeah, maybe we need the camera, maybe we don't need the camera. Actually, the camera is a capital expenditure. Capital expenditure is a long-term investment. It actually falls within equipment. So the cost of the camera is different. Well, what about the cost of operator? If someone has to run the camera, and that's considered normal part of the education process, then the cost of the camera operator becomes operating cost. All right? So operating cost for the university is swimming pool for two months, cleaning the stadium, cleaning the facilities, uh, all the other little things which are just necessary, keeping administration, keeping bureaucracy, oh yeah, keeping security people, keeping security cameras running, all right, oh, normal operating cost is hiring professors, hiring deans, department chairs, secretaries, assistants, and so on. So all of these represent normal, we call them so regular, operating costs. All right. The next one they call interest. I will write it, but that's not the most common one. We call it financing costs. The most simple, the most common, 99% of the times, uh, again, I'm here using financing costs, and I'm continuing on this side, is simply interest. Interest is the most important and most common example of a financing cost. All right. And then the other one, of course, is taxes. Sometimes the government may lower your taxes because you create jobs. And government says, great. Sometimes government will impose extra taxes on you because you're making a lot of profit. It's a, oh, your oil company, we're going to tax you double, okay? Well, they can do that. But it's a, oh, you're a monopolist, you got to pay extra tax. Or, we need jobs. Please expand, hire more people, and we'll have no taxes. So taxes are always a separate expenditure, or it's just an expense of running the business, okay? So, when you are all set and done, and now you have already explained a few, what is called profit. And profit is the same as earnings. That's 
part of what I was explaining is confusing. It's the same as income. The same as income. But the most common one that you will most commonly see accountants love is called net income. All right. And back in the good old days, in old English, when you have all the revenue, well, revenue is not that much, all the expenses and everything, you draw the line, and at the bottom line, you put in that profit number, and it's very commonly called the bottom line. That's how it's called, the equal sign, bottom line. They use it all the time. Five million bottom line. Well, so, if are, so what's the bottom line? 10 million. So, it is, again, explanation called the bottom line because when you have the income statement with all expenses, at the very bottom, the lowest line, which is the bottom line, gives you the profit number, okay? And let's see what else you have. Oh, yeah, besides these, there may be other expenses like we call them in general non-operating income non-operating income <coughs> and non-operating income may be associated with you acquired some truck you depreciated maybe half of it and then you sell it for a little more than half, and the difference becomes effectively a capital gain on the sale. Another non-operating income is similar. You bought a house, and the house gone a little bit in price. You sell it for a little higher price, and you keep the difference. So, non-operating income is associated with what they like to call extraordinary items and these are income which is not regular not common you don't expect to repeat it every month you don't expect it to repeat it even every year okay it just happens one time and sometimes I have seen but you need a top expert in accounting to tell you the exact difference but these are called often one time and becomes one-time gains and one-time losses and one-time expenses. It happened only once and you just don't expect it to happen again. Uh, Non-operating income can it be, for example, losses from an earthquake, not losses from a tsunami, something really terrible in the climate and weather happened and it's not going to happen again or oh, maybe some kind of a fire that happens once in 50 years okay so this is just a one-time event that is not likely to be repeated anytime soon okay if you like to repeat it over and over again it becomes operating operating revenue operating cost and operating income and operating profit and this is not operating okay Let's see what else we have. Well, the most common measure in finance, and it's called actually in business analysis, financial statement analysis, is called, oh, let me write here. It's called EBITs. And EBIT says, and uh, watch over here my finger, says, Earnings before interest and taxes, okay? Earnings before interest and taxes. And if you have a textbook, you will see on page 36 on the left, 
and they have a special name for it called operating income. Operating income. And it's that. It's exactly what it says. Earnings from operations before interest and taxes. That's it. That's all there is to it. Let's see what else. Non-operating assets, sales operating net income. Uh, okay, I already covered depreciation. Now, depreciation is confusing. I'm teaching in my accounting, so let's explain more on depreciation. Depreciation is simply a loss of value. Okay, I already said that. You have here two. The first one is called accumulated depreciation. This is the total amount of depreciation over the life of one particular asset. Example, let's provide an example. Uh, how much does a laptop cost? Let's say laptop. And new Taiwan dollars, NTD. 20,000. So the original price is 20,000. And we say we're going to have a straight line depreciation over five years. Five years. So in year one, year one, for year one, Accumulated depreciation, accumulated depreciation is simply four thousand. That's it. And year two, the accumulated depreciation is eight. In year three, the accumulated depreciation is 12. In year four, the accumulated depreciation is 16. And in year five, the accumulated depreciation is 4,000. All right, let me try to do this trick here. I'm going to delete a little bit to make it a little better. I'm going to say on top, accumulated depreciation. And now you have what's called book value. And book value is simply original value minus accumulated depreciation. So when you buy it, book value 20,000. After one year, book value becomes 16,000. After two years, you record a depreciation becomes 12. Okay? And so on. 12, 16, 12, 8, 4. At the very end, the book value becomes 0. Now, the explanation gets back. That's simply accumulated depreciation. It tells the total accumulation 
over the years from the beginning of the life of the asset until today. The other concept is uh, sorry, is depreciation expense. So, all I'm saying is depreciation is a business expense. And the depreciation expense is the loss of value for the current period. So, book value, now I have expense. So, for year one, The expense is 4000 That's how much you lost. For year two, expense is 4000 For three, four, and five. For year three, year four, and year five, the accumulation, sorry, uh, depreciation expense is always 4000 So this is part of the value which you allocate to the current period as an expense. That's it. So, if you buy, actually another example, uh, in the United States, you can buy a Toyota I don't know, Corolla or Camry for $25,000. You use it for five years as a taxi. So, for the first year, you're going to have $5,000 of the twenty-five will be depreciation expense. That's how much you lost in the value. For the second year, you depreciate another 5000 so you would, would say you expense it again. And that's it. All right. And one last concept of the income statement is called EBITDA. All right, that is on page 38, page. And if you follow my finger, it's the same. This even is the same as this one. Earnings before interest and taxes, and this becomes depreciation and amortization. All right? so. Financial analysts love this particular measure. In during the dot com and the telecom boom, everyone was using it. Now we understand that it's not exactly the correct one. It's not exactly the perfect one. It's got a lot of little problems. But the issue is not whether it's right or wrong. The question is for you to understand what EBITDA means when they say it, what does it mean? What does it include? What does it exclude? Okay? So it excludes interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. That's it. These four important elements don't are not included in there. Alright? And that completes uh, section uh, uh, two three, which is the income statement. And now we move to 2-4. Statement of cash flow, page 38. In page 38, Statement of cash flow has three components, always three components. Uh, you can look on page 39, you're going to see one, I'm going to write it in the same way, one, operating activities. That's number one. 
operating activities. Number two, long term, we call them simply investing activities. investing activities. And number three is called financing. And statement of cash flow simply tells you all the cash inflows and the cash outflows. <coughs> cash inflow is cash coming to the firm, coming inside the firm. and cash outflow, all payments of cash, cash going out of the firm, okay? And now focus, zooming in on operating activities. Operating activities will generate cash, and the cash is coming in the form of operating profit. So let me get rid of this thing here. And I'm continuing on this side, operating profits. And the operating profit is the basis for cash for operating activities. But not everything, and I'm repeating, not everything in the operating profit is cash. So we take the operating profit and we've got to adjust for things which are not cash. Number one is in the textbook C. C, depreciation and amortization. C. Uh, let's, for everyone, and you can also zoom in on the textbook a little bit. So everyone, follow my finger, C. You see, operating activity, line A. The second line, B, net income. C, depreciation and amortization, okay? The number on the right side will be 2.4, 2,400, okay? Does everybody see it in your book? Okay. So, depreciation is a non-cash expense. So we don't need to count it. And that's simple. So, you got operating profit, but you have to add up depreciation. Because depreciation does not affect cash. When you had net income before, you subtracted depreciation to get to net income. Now, you got to add it back. So you add back depreciation, you add back amortization to your profit to get to the cash flow. Next one will be inventories. In this case, it's going to be decrease in inventories. Before, when you started the period, you have 100 computers which you're selling. Then, at the end, you have 60 computers. The decrease of 40 computers you sold for cash and you generated extra cash. And that extra cash must be added. So, this is not about inventories. Don't add the inventories. You add only the change in inventories. So, you have 100 computers and now have 60 
only the difference of 100 to 60, difference of 40 you add. If before you had 60 and now you have 60, there is no change in inventories, you don't add anything. Number uh, E, accounts receivable. Okay, so if you have accounts receivable, actually decrease in account receivable. So before they owe you 1,000, now they owe you 500. The difference was already paid in cash. Whatever payable they paid you back, that's already extra cash or extra cash inflow for the business. We have five more minutes. Uh, and the last one is accrued wages and taxes, DEF. When you have a wage and when you have a tax, you must subtract it from revenues to get to the operating profit. So, the wage, accrued wages and accrued taxes were already subtracted to get to the profit. Now, because they are non-cash expense, you have to add them back to the operating profit to get to the cash flow. So the cash flow is you get the operating profit and then you make all of these, we call them non-cash adjustments non-cash. So any other adjustment to the income statement which does not involve cash, like changes in inventory don't involve cash, accounts receivable don't involve cash, okay? So all of these changes will actually be part of the cash flow. And that's it. That's the operating activities. The second one is called investing. And for investing it's only J. And J becomes additions to, question? Yeah? What about accounts payable? Accounts payable, where is that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Accounts payable. All right, everybody. I was fast and missed accounts payable F. So, actually, <coughs> uh, this accrued wages is G. G is accrued wages, okay, that's my mistake. And F will be accounts receivable, of course, accounts payable. And accounts payable is on the opposite side, so it has to be in the opposite direction. That's why when you read in the book it says decrease in account receivable, but increase in accounts payable. So yeah, if you have increase in account payable, it's the same as decrease in account receivable, we have the same type of effect on cash, okay? So here we're just finding what's different in the cash flow from profit and loss, from revenues and expenses. Yeah, thank you. All right, yeah, remind me, let's give you a bonus point right to your previous exam. Okay. Uh, Back to J. J is, but that's what they call it. They call it property, plant, and equipment. And we shorten this for PPE. And that simply represents additions, as in changes to property, plant, and equipment. Well, of course, if you actually buy a new car, okay, or a new house, well, that's a cash expense. So you will need to add that cash expense, okay? So cash is part of investment. So these are operating with regular business. This is associated with long-term assets, okay? This is associated with long-term assets, all right? So you generate 30000 in cash, okay? And you can use... 20,000 to buy a car, and you got left with 10,000. So the cash that you used for buying a, a car was 
part of the cash flow. And in this particular case, we'll be, again, depending cash inflow and cash outflow, whether you paid in or paid out, whether you purchase an asset or you sold a house. And the last one is financing activities. Financing activities. Let me see where I'm going to write. Okay, I'm going to write here. Financing. And the financing activities are fairly straightforward. M. Increasing in notes payable. If you increase your note payable, in other words, I'm going to pay you an extra million, somebody gave you a million in cash, and in return, you gave them a note payable. So when you increase note payable, you obviously increase cash from financing activities. All right? In other words, you issue financial instrument, you get cash for it. Similar for M, let me see the letter, is N, bond. is in bonds outstanding. You issue more bonds, you raise more cash. It's that simple. <coughs> then you have M N. Uh, I'm still missing the letter. O. Dividends. Dividends are very similar. You pay a dividend, cash goes down. This is the reason why dividends have a negative, <coughs> negative number. When you look, you will see that dividends will actually have a negative number. Paying dividend means cash flow. And there is one they don't have in the textbook, but that was the very, very, very original meaning of financing activity. And that's the first, the oldest, the simplest one, which is stock issuing stock. So, stock issue. You issue new stock, they give you cash. That's the classic financing operation. You issue stock, you get cash. That's a cash inflow when you increase cash. Okay? And the last one will be stock repurchase. Stock repurchase is the exact opposite of stock issue. In a stock repurchase, the corporation pays cash to investor and buys back the stock. Sometimes stock repurchase is called stock buyback. Buyback. It is the exact opposite operation of stock issue. In this particular case, in a stock issue, shares outstanding go up and cash go up. In a stock repurchase, shares outstanding go down and the cash go down. The stock repurchase is returning and paying back the investment to the investor in full, in full. Dividend is paying back to the investment a part of the profit. She still remains the owner. With a stock buyback, the investor gets everything. And the corporation doesn't owe him anymore, and he doesn't have any shares, and doesn't have any ownership anymore. And I think this uh, completes the whole uh, section. There's one other little thing, but I don't want to worry uh, about it. We're pretty much done for today. Uh, so we're going to have the exam all the way up to this section. It will not include, we'll see, okay?